Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life. From actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children all ages, welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life through inspirational, educational and motivational posts. Today's topic is going to be all about mindset and I am, of course, as always, your host, John Morris. My special guest today I'm really, really excited about because he is an author, he is a motivational speaker. He is a former WWE wrestling superstar and, in my opinion, one of the greatest minds of our generation. And I'm not just saying that because he's on here. Please welcome the awesome Mr. Al Snow. Al, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. If I were doing any better, I'd be jealous of myself. (laughs) Well, that's always good. That's always good. Al, for the fans at home uh, that maybe don't know about you, uh, because this is going to a worldwide audience, share with the audience a little bit about yourself and ultimately what it is that you do. Well, I have been a professional wrestler for going on um, 39 years. May 22nd of next year will be my 39th anniversary. Um, I started when I was 18 years old. Um, I made the decision that it's, that was what I wanted to pursue as a career, um, when I was 14 and, uh, I've been blessed to get to do what I am passionate about doing and loving to do for as long as I've gotten to do it. I'm presently, um, owner and CEO of Gladiator Sports Network and, uh, OVW, which is Ohio Valley Wrestling, which is a, formerly was a developmental pro, uh, program, uh, for WWE. And uh, that was where my relationship with OVW began. Um, WWE sent me down here and to be the lead trainer mm-hmm. uh, for their developmental program. And then uh, um, I left uh, when uh, WWE severed its ties with OVW. We parted ways and uh, I became a producer and um, a executive with TNA, Impact Wrestling brought created their developmental program and began another relationship with uh, Impact and myself and OVW. And then that came to an end. Uh, It had its run. And then um, I started uh, just uh, two years ago, um, June of 2018. Uh, My partner, Chad Miller, and I purchased OVW from the founder and creator, uh, Danny Davis. And um, we have been uh, rebuilding uh, OVW um, and both the television show, um, which now stands at about 1,105 consecutive episodes of broadcast television. Um, We have created a secondary show that's now uh, at 42, 43 uh, consecutive episodes already. And um, we are, uh, we are the only um, accredited trade school for professional wrestling, sports entertainment, and broadcasting in the world. Um, And we have a uh, network of schools, affiliate schools, that are around the world. We have uh, four here in the United States, and we have uh, three in the UK, one in uh, Denmark, one in uh, Hungary, one in Romania, um, and two in South America and Chile. So... Wow, that is probably one of the, the most in-depth um, intros, I suppose, that ever that we've ever had. And that's fantastic. There is so much to pack with, or unpack with you. Um, and like I said, I'm really, really excited about doing the show with you. So thank you very much for, for coming on. I want to give a, a special plug as well to Al's book. I purchased it not long after Al and I started talking uh, about doing the show. Uh, haven't been able to put it down. I don't think I've ever read a book in such 
you know, speed in my entire life. And it's called Self-Help Life Lessons from the Bizarre Wrestling Career of Al Snow. Folks, if you want, uh, I guess, a behind the scenes look um, at really what wrestling is about and what wrestling you know, means to so many people, but also what it means to be a professional wrestler and the, the wisdom and the life lessons that come along with that, Al's book is definitely one that I would recommend. And you can get that over on Amazon and I'm sure wherever good books are sold. Um, so Al, I, I want to ask you, you know, we'll start right at the beginning. Um, what was life like for you as a child? Was, was wrestling always something that you had seen and wanted to do? Or what, what were your other interests as a child? Well, I had uh, many other interests, you know, as a child. I was a little more introverted, a little more quirky. And um, certainly, uh, you know, I uh, was an avid reader. I've always been an avid reader from uh, when I was a young child on. Um, and, uh, um, you know, had other in, interests as far as sports were concerned. Um, but as a young child, a really young child, uh, you know, we were, I was exposed to re professional wrestling on television, like most people. And then um, where I lived, uh, the company that where it was at had closed up. And uh, I didn't see any for several years. And then in my um, early teenage years, um, wrestling kind of returned thanks to the advent, and this is how old I am, thanks to the advent of cable television. Because mm -hmm. um, I come from a world of actual rotary phones and yep. um, lack of cable television. <laughs> so... Um, I still remember the dials on the TV long before remotes came along. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was why our parents had us, was to go change the channel on the television set. And they used to be so big as and, well. Um, Hilarious. Oh, yeah. The console TVs were enormous. They were a piece of furniture. And uh, so, you know, it wasn't until that came about Um that uh, wrestling came back and, and, and it just captured my uh, passion, my interest. And, uh, and then, and I just, for whatever reason, still to this day, when people ask, why do you do it? I, I couldn't tell you, you know, but um, you know, the, the old saying's true. I mean, it really, really is. And that is, if you follow, follow your passion, you know, you'll, you'll never work a day in your life. And that doesn't mean that I don't work extremely hard or, extremely long hours, uh, or, you know, um, putting a lot of time and diligence into whatever I'm trying to do. But, uh, but when you enjoy it, you know, it's, uh, it's a different story. You know, it's, it's, it really makes a big difference. It, it really does. And, um, you know, you, you and I, again, you know, we share so many of the same passions. You know, I, I was exposed to wrestling with my granddad from SummerSlam 88 and, and before then. And for us, it was a real wonderful bonding thing. And from, gosh, you know, I mean, all through my childhood, it was wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. Um, you know, I, I went more down the amateur route of, you know, the grappling style, because I love that. It's a very weird thing when you try to describe it to someone. Um, you know, when someone's trying to put your elbow up to the back of your head, why that would be fun. But I don't know why, but for me, it was just that connection. Like I said, I, I enjoyed uh, a lot of amateur uh, wrestling before I got into bodybuilding and, and other things afterwards. And, and you went down the, the professional route um, and, and obviously, like you said, wanted to make a career in that. I wanted to talk to you and obviously, like I said, we're going to be pulling a lot from, from your book today, um, which like I said, I can't plug enough. Um, and, and I want to talk to you about your first uh, how can I phrase this? Your first entrance into wrestling when you meet the Andersons. Um, and I suppose the, the story that unfolds there, just to set the scene a little bit for the folks at home, I never got to see Gene Anderson, um, but Ole Anderson from interviews that I've seen and I guess seeing him on TV, he is built like a brick privy. Um, you know, really big guy, very surly guy as well. Um, not the kind of guy that I, I would... <laughs> you really want to spend a great deal of time with no offense. <laughs> Am I probably on the mark there? Um, the large majority of the uh, professional wrestlers back in that mm -hmm. day and time were not only, you know, large uh, men, um, they were very hard, mm -hmm. very grizzled um, and uh, men. And it was at that point in time, um, it was a very closed, very secular mm -hmm. business. 
Um, it was easier to become a made man in the mafia than it was quite honestly, than to yeah. become a professional wrestler. You know, it was very, uh, <clears throat> like the Masons, like you, you, you either needed to be a family member or you had to know somebody that was in. And if yeah. you didn't, it was next to impossible for you to, to broach the, uh, the barrier, um, and get in it and actually get indoctrinated into professional wrestling. And it was ran very much in a lot of ways, like. Uh, the mob, like the mafia, there were rules of conduct and etiquette. And, and, and if you, you know, uh, broke those, then you were, uh, you were blackballed, you were pushed out. Um, and, um, you know, the, uh, they are going to, uh, I had a tryout in Charlotte, North Carolina, um, because at the time when I was a teenager, um, you know, I would, there was not the internet or Google. So I was required to go to our local public library um, that had uh, phone books um, that had from every major city in the United States. And so I'd taken the wrestling magazines, found out the main office promotionally for a particular city. I would go get the city's phone book. I'd find the office's phone number. Once a month, I would call them begging to be trained to be a professional wrestler. Um, <clears throat> as I got closer to 18, um, now I, one day I called, uh, I, like I always do, um, Charlotte, North Carolina and to the Jim Crockett promotions. And I got a hold of Gene Anderson who was in the office at the time and informed me of a tryout they were having okay. in, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And, um, you know, I, uh, went down there and, um, and basically, you know, I was, <laughs> just physically um, stripped of everything. Um, That's putting it mildly. <laughs> to try to break, to try to break me mentally and emotionally, and to try to make me quit or give up. <clears throat> I didn't. Um, I ended up with a busted nose and, you know, hair pulled out of my head and bite marks on my back, and you know, I gathered myself up and went back out and uh, you know shook their hands and. Uh, you know, and uh, came that night to the uh, the wrestling show mm -hmm. that was uh, taking place at the arena, the same arena, and then uh, came home and continued my pursuit of the objective of becoming a professional wrestler. So, what was kind of going you know, through your? Some mind? would say I was insane. Like, yeah, yes, <laughs> I said some would say I was insane. Yeah, <laughs> but, but the, you know, and again, you know, a lot of people look at it, and th there's two things that I really pull out of that, and, and the first one again is your mindset. I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Um, but also, I mean, what was going through your head? Was it kind of like, apart from your ass, you know, but, but was it literally a case of, oh my goodness, what am I thinking? What, what am I getting into? Or was this even then what, what you'd seen and obviously gone through? Was it just like, I still want to do this. This is what I, I love and yeah. enjoy. I mean, here's the thing um, to get into the existentialism and the philosophical side of things. Um, uh, you are not uh, a product of circumstances. Mm -hmm. I know that everybody likes to believe that they're a victim and, uh, yeah. you know, and there are, there are clearly mm -hmm. um, situations that are out of our control um, that occur to us. Um, but I made a conscious decision. And I think one of the most powerful forces in your life is to make a conscious decision. Yeah. Once you've made that conscious decision, um, and always, there's always action that follows it. Mm -hmm. If you've really, truly made a yes or no decision, um, then you start moving forward. And, uh, you know, um, I made a conscious decision that that was what I was going to do. Now, I've, I had a lot more, um, and when I think back on it now, I can understand why you would ask that question, but I had a lot more adversity and a lot more mm -hmm. challenges before mm -hmm. I ever was able to get my foot in the door, okay. but at no point in time did I ever uh, have second thoughts. I never questioned it. Yeah. Um, I never thought, "Oh, what was me? Why am I having to go through this?" I just did it. Yeah. And because I had made the decision that I was going to do it, mm -hmm. and then and, and as a result, um, I was able to to, you know. That was the only reason I was able to do it. It was yeah. not that I had some incredible intestinal fortitude or, you know, uh, um, I was physically tough or whatever. Yeah. It was because I made a decision and there was no alternative. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was, you either do it or you, you know, and there's no other way. So, and I, I truly believe um, from my own experience, you know, and a lot of people are very skeptical uh, about this, um, but I truly, really believe that um, if you make a decision and you truly want to do something and you've, you've just made the, a, a clear decision to do it, that no matter what you face, no matter how long it takes, yeah. that you'll be able to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, that sounds like a lot of falderall and, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, uh, motivational speaking type mm -hmm. of stuff. But I can, uh, you know, the reason that everybody says it, that's usually somebody you're wanting to hear from that's been successful to some degree is because quite honestly, they, they've, they started out no different than you, or maybe even with a less of an opportunity or even less resources and we're still able to pursue their dreams and do what they wanted to do yeah no and, and you know al you know i can you know completely agree with what you're saying there because again you know you make that mental shift um i did it in the world of art i'm doing it in obviously with mind body and soul and with the podcast because i think when people see where they want to go and where they really want to be then you figure out the steps that you got to take to get there it's, it always comes with figuring out the destination first. Um, usually, certainly in my experience, um, you know, you, you have your idea in mind of this is where I see myself in 20 years from now, and now I've got to figure out. And sometimes those, you know, uh, journeys, you know, they do pivot and they do, um, you know, take a direction that maybe we weren't expecting. But, you know, I completely agree with you. And, and like you said, when you make a conscious decision that, okay, you know, it's, it's like Yoda says, you know, that there is either you do it or you don't do it, but there is no try. Um, and I think right. it is, it, it literally, you will, simple as that. all roads will lead to the same place. Some yeah. just take a little longer. Yeah. Um, it's, but you have to be, uh, one of the key things I think people have to do is that they have to be completely blatantly honest with themselves mm -hmm. at all times. You know, we all lie every day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether we think so or we don't, yeah. then we're basically lying to ourselves then too, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just accept it. You're not perfect. Yeah. You're not, you know, you're not the epitome. You, you do live in a glass house, so mm -hmm. don't throw stones. Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concept of how to get from where you are to where you want to be? Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up? Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success, but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only going to get an experienced life coach, you're also going to get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time with the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams and maybe just letting our dreams go by. It depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did, and I'll see you soon. And 
Um, but when you are blatantly honest, mm -hmm. when you you give a dollar to or you give a pound to a homeless person, yeah. um, and then you tell yourself you did that out of the goodness of your heart. No, you didn't. You did that because it made you feel yeah. good. You got something back mm -hmm. in return for doing it. You know, so accept that and then accept the fact that if you're wanting to do things, if you're wanting to live a life that others don't live, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to accept and be willing to do things that others don't do. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to. The the life that we all get sold when, when we're children is that, you know, uh, you know, mom and dad live in a, a house or, you know, a flat and they go and, you know, they go to work, you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five or eight to four or whatever. And then they come home every evening and then the weekends are off. And then if, you, if you're willing, you're wanting to live a life <clears throat> that is going to be in the public and it's going to be, you've one, you've got to be a personality and be a person that doesn't live that same mm -hmm. life. Because people will not pay to see somebody they can see for free. Right. And two, you've got to understand that your life structure um, your family interaction and structure aren't going to be the same as everyone else's around you. And, you know, and you've got to be willing to accept that. And you've got to be willing, even if you're just an entrepreneur, you've got to be willing to understand that you're going to not work 40 hours a week. Yeah. You're going to work 140 oh, yeah. hours a week because, you know, it's, it's the business isn't the business. The mm -hmm. business is you, yeah. you know, and, um, and being and, and, and be honest with yourself and say, I, I am willing to accept that this is the way things are going to be in order for me to achieve and be where I want to be when to, and have the things I want to have. Yeah, no, I, and I think that's fantastic. I, again, advice. You know, I, I always, in some ways, I smile these days, but you, I used to be kind of offended when people would say, oh, well, what else can wrestling teach you? You know, Native American spiritual teaching will teach you that everything has another teaching if you're only wise enough to look for it. And for wrestling, for me, you know, it's taught me how to, you know, you might say do a promo. It's taught me how to talk at least, even sure. for a guy with dyspraxia. Um, you know, it, it's taught me, you know, so many different things. But one of the things that I always remember, you know, them talking about Vince McMahon, which is the head of WWE. We'll talk about him later on in the show. Um was the fact that it, you know, it wasn't him coming to work. For him, this is a lifestyle. And I applied that to my own self when I was like, because people would ask me, you know, what were you, you doing mind, body, and soul? You're doing this and you're doing that and you're teaching. And you, I said, yeah, but this is part of my life. This is what it takes for me to be and to live the kind of life that I want to live. Um, you know, and I, I think some of the times people don't achieve their dreams because uh, either it's that, you know, like, like you said, you know, they like themselves, they, they haven't got that mindset that's in them or ha they haven't made that commitment and conscious decision to themselves to say, I'm doing whatever it takes. And whatever it takes is, you know, well, it's open. <laughs> so. and, and whatever it takes isn't a negative thing. Yeah. When a lot of people hear that, they think, oh, you're going to have to sacrifice. Well, if it's again, if it's something that is a passion for you, it's never a sacrifice. Right. Yeah. And you will have a life. I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll have an interesting, unusual, based on what everybody <laughs> else's is, but it'll still be, you know, you'll be out living a life. You won't just be alive. You'll be out yeah. living a life. You know? Yeah. And, and, and the, thing. well, the roads that it can lead you to are, are so incredible. And I know we, we can both speak to that. Al, one of the things that I want to talk about a little bit, because, um, and, and obviously just before we move away, um, Al, obviously, and you, you can check out some of the, the struggles that he had just to get to his first uh, tryout with the Andersons. This is a guy, folks, literally, that when we talk about willing to do what it takes just to get to that first step, just to that foot in the door, um, and I know there's probably a ton more stuff in there that isn't covered in your book, um, you know, it, it's an incredible story and, and, you know, very, very inspirational as well. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the underground fighting uh, that was there. And again, I, I remember it briefly. It was one of the, in my, in my footnotes that was there. What was your kind of lead into that? What was the mindset, I suppose, as well of, of maybe the mindset is the wrong word, but what was the emotion, I suppose, that you were feeling having to deal with interesting characters would that be a, a correct way to put it <laughs> yeah to say the least <laughs> um the uh 
that kind of came up um, totally like a uh, never planned. Um, you know, I was uh, involved at the time. I had just started a wrestling training school and was trying to get it up off the ground. And I needed to make money and pay bills. And um, I was approached at that time by a promoter. It was a bar owner, actually. Um, and uh, they wanted to do like tough man contests okay. on Monday night. Now, this was back before Monday Night Raw and, uh-huh. you know, um, and, um, you know, they would pay me to bring the ring down and I would set the ring up and, you know, I would, uh, um, sit there until the fights wouldn't really start until about 10 o'clock at night. Okay. And, you know, and one thing got led to another and the, um, partner of the owner had heard that I was a professional wrestler and was operating a, basically what they call a garage fights, which, you know, in garages or pole barns, whatever. And uh, it approached me and was like, would you like to make some, some extra money? And at the time I was, you know, trying to make ends meet. And um, um, so I agreed to do it. And, uh, you know, I, I think I only did like five or six fights. Um, and then of course uh, th- there was drama that pers- ensued um, at the local bar the following uh, Monday, you know, and um, that was, I apologize. I got a phone call. Um, the, uh, you know, the following Monday after I had, uh, won one of the fights and then the brother and of the other, the guy I fought plus him, the guy that I'd fought showed up and we, we got into a situation at the bar and okay. the following week after that. And I was like, you know what, this, this isn't worth the aggravation to, to do it. Um, and I've never really spoken about it. I'm not, you know, I've never been really uh, proud of the fact that I did it. Um, I'm not one of those type of people who go around and brag about, well, you know, I've, I've done fought this guy and done this. And, um, but it was an interesting world and it was, you know, uh, a very much a different environment. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's interesting to, I think probably one of the most fascinating things to me from the, from what I learned from it is it's one thing to, to get into a physical altercation, like it happens and prompt you, you know, you're just, your blood's up. It's another when you spend all day knowing <laughs> that in five or six hours, you're going to get in a fight, yeah. you know, and, um, and you're mentally um, trying to prepare yourself and, you know, pace that, pace that out, that anticipation um, up until the moment occurs. Yeah. You know, and, it's because uh, it's one of the things you don't want to in, peak too early. And, and by the time the fight comes, you're just absolutely exhausted, nothing to give. But at the same point, it's like the uh, uh, <laughs> kind of how I was this morning. I woke up, yeah. like, I'm interviewing Al Snow today. <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> you're trying to balance, you know, between trying to ramp up emotionally and yeah. mentally, and at the same time, keep it calm and pace it out so that, like you did say, like you're prepared. You don't want to be too laid back and unfocused and at the same time you don't want to be burned out and you know and it it, that was probably the worst part of it was just the you know that lead up and the anticipation of it the whole time was like just please can i'd have rather just woke up rolled out of bed and had somebody hit me (laughs) and be done and then (laughs) sit there and just okay here we go tonight's the night (sighs) and and you know and And then the drive to the building and so go my just the you know the whole drive to the building mm-hmm. and then getting inside and you know it just you know i i guess some people thrive on that or you know uh, live for it um you know and it is it's intoxicating you know the adrenaline rush um but uh yeah it, it it'll it can be uh wearing that's for sure i can imagine and then you know again everything that's on top of that like you said the stress the anxiety everything else and obviously everything that builds from that um it, it is a completely different world and i think you know very very far away from what a lot of people you know uh, think about um and it's it's just a whole different world but like you say you needed to pay the bills and it was, it was an opportunity at that point and and it took you in a different direction um and it was a good experience you know yeah. it, it was you know everything i i feel everything is a uh is not good or bad per se as it is it gives you good information for great stories later in life. So now I've got a really interesting story. You know, at the time <laughs> I didn't find it so interesting, but now I look back and I'm like, oh, you know what? That's that's different. That's pretty cool. 
but that's it, you know, and I keep saying to folks, you know, now I'm setting out on an adventure where we're able to help, you know, so many other people a decade after sure. being made homeless and, and going through all the things that I went through, the exact same thing for, for you, you know, now we're able to say, well, I can talk about this. I've got some experience in this uh, and everything else. Yeah. Um, we, we've obviously emailed backwards and forwards and, you know, I, I want to be as sensitive as possible and as respectful as possible to every guest that we interview. Um, if it's okay with you to talk about the temptations of life and the part of your book sure. that you talk about, and I, and I really do appreciate that because I know there's a lot of people that struggle with, with life in, in general. Uh, everybody, I think, struggling with something. That's why my brand new book, which is available at the battles or the battles we all face.com, it's called The Battles We All Face, and it's got a chapter in there for each different um, topic that we you know, we cover whether it's anxiety, trauma, letting go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, in life, what, it, what I've certainly found, it was talked to me by a very, very wise man. It was that we reap what we sow more than what we sow, later than what we sow. And you've got a chapter in your book. And the, I believe that the motto or the, the phrasing is when we break the rules as a child, you know, it, it's only us that, that gets hurt. When we break the rules as an adult, everybody else gets hurt and you know i'm sure there'll be people out there that have never had these issues and everything out there but folks i just want to say you know because folks are going through this all the time you know temptations of life get to each and every one of us regardless of what we do and you know unless you've walked in somebody's shoes understood everything that's going on then you really don't have a place to make a, a judgment um, and I don't think it's fair to we that. Um, but with that in mind, to set the stage a, a little bit, when we talk about that chapter, obviously, you know, you've, you, at, at that time you were having struggles in your in your home life, the pressures that were there. Mm -hmm. um, you were having this time on the road, and and now you're in you know involved with wrestling a lot more. And, and I'm assuming you're probably doing this you know a couple of nights at least or full time um, at that point in time. Full time. Right. And yeah. um, so, you know, you talk about being on the road, you talk about the loneliness and everything there. You know, Tony Robbins was great at talking about the seven fundamental needs that we all need. Um, sure. And sometimes when these difficult things happen in life, we don't make the best decisions. Al, if it's all right for, for you to talk about this and it's not too sensitive, um, would you walk us through kind of the, <laughs> you look at now and it's, it's almost like a bizarre story that really unfolded towards the end, but the, 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 the series of events that followed with the lady that gave you attention, shall we say, um, at the, sure. the wrestling shows? Yeah, I was uh, married at the time. I was on the road. Um, and, uh, you know, um, all, all of the other circumstances and situations do play a part in the role. But really, ultimately, I just made poor decisions. Okay. Um, you know, I got decided, made decision, uh, ultimately, you know, um, because I own, I do very try very hard to own my mistakes. Yeah. Because I feel like once I own the mistakes, then nobody can use them against me anymore. That they, they lose their power. Um, so I made a decision to uh, have a one night stand with this young lady, um, and then basically to the she had um, found out my not my wrestling identity, my non Nigeria, but had found out my legal <laughs> identity and my address and phone number and basically to a degree threatened me that if I didn't return and continue the relationship that she would divulge the fact that we had uh, had an encounter to my then wife and um, um, so uh, to you know I foolishly thinking well I'll play along and I'll placate her um, which was part of my people pleasing side of things at that time where I tried to make everyone happy um, you know it simply created a deeper relationship that um, once we, it was severed because of the fact that I had to leave the particular area where I was wrestling because I had gotten an opportunity with WWF, yeah. <clears throat> the resultant backlash from the, uh, the, the girl, the uh, young lady was that she uh, had of course developed a deeper relationship than what I had thought yeah. um, and had expected. And um she lashed out, uh, informed my wife of the situation, um, had uh, started to uh, make uh, threats 
um, made phone calls to WWF making claims that I had sexually assaulted her, hoping that it would result in me uh, being removed from the roster. Um, she uh, um, finally, with all these different efforts, it culminated in um, she, her uh, uh, driving uh, to see me, uh, to confront me uh, physically. And um, the, uh, I had found, out, found this out from uh, the police detective who had arrived at my home um, because they had found her um, car alongside the uh, motorway and with wind, all the windows broken out and blood throughout the car. So wow. they had assumed that there had been foul play and um, that um, she had been murdered. And so um, I was under investigation for her murder for about two weeks. And then they found her hiding out uh, several states away. Um, and um, she had basically faked or falsified her own death and implicated me in the potential possibility that I murder her. Um, by, um, from what I had unbeknownst to me at the time, while we were in some uh, sort of type of relationship, she had been secretly videotaping me. So keep in mind back then the video cameras yeah. were huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, she had hi hidden them in the rooms, had audio recordings and et cetera to that she'd given to her family that proved that we had the existing relationship. And then of course, a motive for me wanting to dispose of her. Um, so it was a very tense uh, time. Um, it caused a lot of emotional strife for everyone involved, you know? Um, and, you know, I take responsibility because I made those decisions that created the situation. So I can't blame the young lady um, 100%. Um, I have to take it on my own and, um, you know, it, it caused a lot of problems for a lot of years in my mm -hmm. then marriage. And, um, you know, it was, uh, um, it was a huge mistake uh, where uh, not only did I get hurt in a lot of different ways, but uh, everyone around me um, all did, as, did as well. And, uh, you know, um, every, we all go through that um, where we're faced with those decisions to make. Um, and, you know, um, you've got to weigh out the momentary, uh, satisfaction or enjoyment that you're going to yeah. get from your long-term price, because yeah. I think that really drove home, uh, to me, um, at that point in time, um, the fact that for every decision that I made, that there was a price, there was a consequence to that decision. Uh, I was gonna, never going to get anything for free, that it was going to cost me mentally, emotionally, or yeah. financially, or physically in some way. Um, and therefore, going forward, I always had to evaluate whether or not, um, you know, the, uh, the, the decision was worth the cost. Yeah. Um, and if the answer was no, then there was no point in doing it, you know. Um, you know, the, a, you know, no matter how attractive the object or the person or whatever it may be is, you've got to say, you've got to ask yourself at some point and, and go, no matter how driven you are, yeah. you've got to say, stop for a second and go, is, at 61 minutes, is this still going to be as attractive and be worth the aggravation and the emotional cost that it's going to exact? And if the answer is no, then don't bother with it. Yeah. Know what I mean, if it is, and it is for you, and listen, I don't judge anybody, okay? Because I, I, I truly don't, because my motto is, is I, I, you know, don't judge someone simply because they sin differently than you. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that, because we all do. Well, that and that's it, and that's a fantastic, you know, way, way to put it. Um, because I know a lot of people who would hear that would be like, oh, I can't believe that happened. But folks, you got to realize that it's not just limited to sports athletes, you know, or, you know, or, or anything. Everyone does it. And, That's it. and you mean, can find it. Yeah. You can find temptation right in your backyard. You can Absolutely. find it across the fence. You can find it at the grocery store. You can you sometimes just find be... it in your own mind. You know, <laughs> more than anything. Correct. Um, but, you know, yeah. and, and so, yeah. All I was going to say there was, you know, we you know, find it funny sometimes because you, you, you did pick up a little bit about the, you know, the, the pleasing nature that you, that you have, that, you know, you, you want people essentially to go walk away with a smile in the face. You don't want to, you know, upset people. Um, and I share a lot of that. And I found when I was even working with clients, some of these clients would be 
gosh, 60s and 70s, and, you know, they would have no other social interaction at all. And because you showed them a little bit of, you know, um, interaction and chatted with them and, you know, you developed a business relationship, it ends up going, you know, where they think, oh, well, I've been in a relationship with this guy. You know, we love each other. And you think, on what planet does that ever make sense? And then I've got to look back in my own self and see what was it that I said or what was it I did? And, and my wife and I think we have a very uh, open relationship where we talk about a lot of things that, that go on. And sometimes we'll laugh about it. You know, I've got a 78-year-old woman that, 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 that's got the hearts for me, you know, and, and we, we chuckle about it. But at the same point, you kind of look at it and say, you know, on the other side, you've got to be careful and accountable, like you said, for your own behavior, for your own decisions, whether you're in the right frame of mind or you're in the wrong frame of mind. When we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we find out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in and has been specifically placed there to give you, the reader, an association to the subject discussed. Please don't delay. You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay. Order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself as long as you're drawing breath to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below and I'll see you on the other side. You do, and you, you know, and you have to realize there are a lot of people out there that live very empty lives, mm -hmm. very pedantic lives. Yeah. And and if you're a person that has a lot of positive energy about yourself, and you you know, and for 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 me being a television mm -hmm. personality, yeah. um, people feel like they personally know me, mm -hmm. and then they have something lacking, something missing. And they feel like you are the thing that fulfills that. Yeah. They are, a lot of these people are drowning people. And mm -hmm. I realize now that that young lady was a drowning person. And, and a drowning person will grab onto anything to save themselves and will drag you under so they can survive. Yeah. You're, you're the light at the end of the tunnel. And, uh, they're, and you know they're not going to stop at anything. You know, I've had, since then too, I've had several people, you know, people that have stalked me and have become wow. obsessed with me and I've had to deal with those people. And it's not fun. It's not enjoyable no. because there's no way to win yeah. the situation. People, well, you should just, this, you should do that. Well, that's a rational approach. Yeah. Ask, absolutely. It's a rational approach, 
but you're talking about taking a rational approach with an irrational person. Right. Yeah. And what they desperately want, desperately need is your attention. Mm -hmm. And they don't care if it's positive or negative. Yeah. If they can get your attention and retain it, mm -hmm. then they're satisfied. They're, you're now a part of, still a part of their life. Yeah. And the biggest thing that they want to prohibit is, you know, your departure from their life to any degree. Yeah. Um, you know, and, 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 and for that to happen, they have to control you. And then if they have to control it, the one way they can control you is to try to burn your life to a ground so, yeah. so that they can, now they can take over what le is left of yours. You yeah. know, you're the only bastion you, they have, you have, they are the only bastion you have as much as you're the only bastion they have. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you have to be aware of those things. So there are those people out there and it's not, you know, not saying that you're, a victim because yeah, it yeah. takes place but you've got to weigh those circumstances when you're about to make a decision because it that plays a factor and is a cost that yeah. you're going to have to try to bear absolutely i'm just seeing over your shoulder the photo of roddy uh piper former professional wrestler sadly no longer with us and i believe actually he went through similar things when he ended up moving his family up into the mountains in colorado i think it was because people had been stalking him so you know folks th this is not something like we've said that you know is, is a one-off you know this happens whether you're a wrestler an artist uh you know w whatever it is it happens in every uh, you can be a car salesman you know absolutely. if you you connect with the you know it doesn't doesn't and it doesn't have to be a, a sexual thing you yeah. know these people connect um because of, of an energy thing and they and they identify with you and then next thing you know again and again it seems irrational well it is irrational yeah. to a rational person right. but it's completely rational to that irrational person yeah. so did you, you know have, sorry, it uh exacerbates the situation when it takes on even more of a physical relationship yes, so. yes absolutely um you know and and the, the, again you know that there's so much to pull out that one I, I i wanted to ask as well did you have you know friends and support around you at that time that you could talk to about this or was that or was you on the road um so much that it was just you know we've just got to keep well, on. when you're on the road um you're you're around people and you mm -hmm. have a camaraderie with yeah the people that you're around but they're also competitors yeah. so you know um and you don't really try to divulge too much of your own personal yeah. life because you don't want it then used against you because right. they, they are competitors so you live a very surprisingly um even though you're around people you live a very lonely life yeah. you know and um and that's that but that's a good thing mm -hmm. people like say it like um you know uh say things like that like oh what was me and you know but i could tell you from from uh experience that um learning to be alone is a good thing mm -hmm. and learning to be happy with yourself yeah. by yourself um gives you an amazing edge in life mm -hmm. because it allows you to be truly uh independent um, there's nothing wrong with needing people um, in your life, and we all do because we're, you know, pack animals by nature, um, and we need those personal relationships and that physical contact, and even if of just a touch of a hand. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in order for you to, I guess, uh, what I'm really saying is, by being alone, by being learning to be happy with yourself, the biggest thing that you learn from that is self-respect. Yeah, and in my opinion, that. My opinion's worth what it costs to get. So, and you know, which is nothing. The most valuable and most important asset in any human relationship is respect. Mm -hmm. um, the old mantra about you can you can't love somebody if you don't love yourself is BS. It's complete and utter bullshit. And the reason I say that is because you can't love yourself if you don't respect yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, you cannot have a true human relationship without mutual respect. But in order for you to have mutual respect, you first and foremost have to respect yourself. Yeah. And, um, and in order to love yourself, you have to respect yourself. In order to love someone else, truly love them, you have to respect them. In order to be a friend, a true friend, you have to respect them. And they have to, in turn, respect you. Mm -hmm. And without that, don't fool yourself. I mean, there is no, you're not going, you're going to have a, sh a very shallow, very hollow relationship with the person. Um, but you're not going to have, you know, a true friendship you're not going to have a true love you're not going to even business you can't yeah. really 
truly you can conduct business, but of course it's um, it is a matter of one person profiting from another person, oh. or you can have a true business relationship where both it's mutually beneficial and both make money. But in order to have that type of relationship, it requires mutual respect. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I think people need to learn that and understand that. Um, and the only way that you'll ever be happy by yourself with yourself is if you respect yourself. I think that's absolutely fantastic um, advice. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and that, that closes that, that section very, very nicely, which is fantastic. I wanted to, to ask and to, to move on, I suppose, with, with dealing with the, the stress and the struggle, uh, we, we're now entering a phase where you have just entered the WWE. Um, I suppose that the first question that, that's on my mind was, how was it from a, a stress point of view you're now traveling all over the world. Walk us through the, an, on an average day for a professional wrestler in the WWE, what does that look like? Well, I'll take you through both parts of that as far as the average day and then, then the uh, stress of it. Thank you. Um, basically, being a professional wrestler is Groundhog Day. So you're going to wake up really early to get to an airport so that you can stand in line to check in in some manner to some degree, stand in line to go through security to some degree. Then you're going to stand in line to get on the plane. Why you need to stand in line to get on the plane, I have no idea. I've been flying for years, but for some reason, whenever they immediately announce that people get to board the plane, um, most of the passengers that are in the waiting gate area assume that you get a prize if you're the first one that gets on the plane. Uh, trust me, I've gotten on the plane first. They've never given me anything other than the seat that I was assigned to sit in. You're not, the plane's not leaving without you. Um, you're not going to lose your seat because you're assigned to it. Um, you do not need to get up and clog the human artery of the gangway to get on the plane. Uh, two, then you stand in line once the plane lands to get off because as soon as that bell rings, it's as if they're practicing a fire uh, escape from the back of the plane as people rush forward, and I don't know where they're going because people stand up in front of them and they just clog again the human artery of trying to get off the plane simply so that they can run down because apparently they have such an emotional connection to their luggage that they need to desperately stand there for the next 20 minutes at the baggage claim waiting on the arrival of their suitcase. Now, they have surrounded the baggage claim much like starving children in a third world country, and the baggage claim was a, third, was a food truck from UNICEF. They will not move to where you have to battle your way through to get the bags so that you can simply go over and stand in line to get a rental car. Now you get your rental car, you drive to a hotel to stand in line to check in, you then go get something to eat, you work out, you go back to the hotel to clean up, and then you go to the arena so you can wander around backstage miserably with, because you wrestlers have a tendency to just complain about everything until you can go out into the arena and live and do what you love to do for anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Um, you'll go back, sit in the back of the arena with everybody complaining and grousing and rumoring and being miserable and then you'll go get something to eat you'll go to bed after you've been on the phone with your significant other who has been complaining to you about the fact for the for the seventh night that you have been home for 10 nights mm -hmm. and that you're not going to be home for another four and then you're only coming home for one and then you're going to start the whole process again and you're going to go to bed at two or three to be up by six so that you can start it over um that's a day um, that's, there are other activities that are involved in that, but that's pretty much a day sometimes. Um, the stress is of course that you're always living the life of where you have to be somewhere at some point, sometime by, a, by a certain schedule. The real stress though, that people don't realize is that you're only as good as the last time you perform. Yeah. So. A piece of every advice time that you I have go out, <laughs> every time you go out and you perform, every single time you're being evaluated and you're being mm -hmm. judged. And you're being evaluated and you're being judged on only two things. One, are you the thing that is motivating everyone that showed up there to show up? Mm -hmm. Or are you one of the things that helped? 
because there isn't a third option. And if you don't play those two roles, then you're gone. Mm -hmm. Every single week you are evaluated and your name comes up around the table. And if it doesn't make it around the table, no matter how great you were, no matter how much you did, your, your career's over with WWE. Now, you have to live under that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even on the days that you're not, because it's so ultra competitive for everything that's gotten up there that when you go out, not only do you have the pressure that your boss who's sitting there watching you, um, but that there are at least 20,000 people live in that building. And then there are millions upon millions around the world. And if you make one mistake, you don't hit that goal in the World Cup of Soccer. And that's going to happen every Monday night, 52 weeks a year. And every Friday night now for SmackDown. Yep. And then on pay-per-views once a month, 12 months a year. Mm -hmm. And then every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you've got to go out and do the same thing. So <clears throat> the pressure, yeah. the stress... And the constant uh, politics and competitiveness of the backstage area um, never go away. Mm -hmm. um, um, and they're, they're existent there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's like standing in front of the hangman's news mm -hmm. and knowing at any point in time that they can kick the block out from underneath your feet. But you've got to continuously be at your absolute 100% wow. consistently yeah. the, the best you possibly can. That puts it in a very, very different, you know, again, light, I think for many, many people that will be watching this, um, because, you know, again, and I know, you know, all over the place, you always hear wrestlers in the 80s and 90s were taking this drug and that drug when, and this isn't to excuse anybody and, and, and you know, in no way directly related, but you start to understand a little bit more of the pressures that people are under and why so many wrestlers, uh, as we'll talk about later on, end up cracking um, you know, in, in, in such, you know, such ways that they do. Yeah. Um, you also have to understand that you're the product that's being sold. Correct. It's not a team sport. Yeah. So if I'm coming, you know, I've been on the road for, you know, the last, you know, 17, 18 days mm -hmm. and now I've got the flu or I've got a twisted yeah. ankle or I've got a, I've got a bruised back. Um, you don't care because you bought a product That's that it. I sold you. And now when I show up, I better give you the product that yeah. you paid to see. Because yeah. if I don't, the likelihood of you paying to see it again is slim and none. So I have to live under that pressure as well, that every night I have to go out and perform to the level that I've sold you to expect. Uh, and if I don't, then eventually no one's gonna buy my product. Yeah. So physically it takes a toll. Now I know a lot of people will say, oh, wrestling's fake. <laughs> Please understand, wrestling is not fake, okay? Um, wrestling is an art form of physical storytelling within the context of a competitive situation. So therefore, the only thing that's not real, there's only one thing that's not real in wrestling, and that is that we know who's going to win and who's yeah. going to lose. The, the illusion is, is that we're believing, making, hoping that you will follow along and allow yourself to believe that, you know, that that isn't predetermined. And that the, it has a gravity and a consequence as to who wins and who loses. And as most competitive situations do. And, um, but physically, the light ring is not a trampoline or a mattress. Absolutely. Um, it's constructed of a steel frame with two by 12s and uh, a little bit of padding. And the flex in the ring allows to absorb some of the impact. But believe me when I tell you that that impact is dramatic. Um, uh, university did a study a physics study on the impact of whenever we would strike the mat and the, uh, the impact was the equivalent of a 22 and a half mile, 22 and a half mile per hour car accident every wow. time we struck the mat or greater. Um, so it takes a toll on your body, uh, every night and, um, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> It's not to complain about it because that's, you know, you make your choices, but to, you know, to understand that uh, you wanted to know the stresses and the pressure yeah, in the regular day life. Imagine going out there and having a repeated 22 and a half mile per hour car accident yeah. uh, for 10 minutes 
And then you've got to walk out of there off the adrenaline high, drive two hours, go to a hotel, wake up, fly, get to a town, work out to maintain a certain physique and physical ability, and then start the process all over again. In addition to the fact that at any moment, at any time, it could all be taken away from you. Yeah. I mean, you know, like, like I say, folks, that really puts things in perspective. I was watching one of your um, matches recently because it was one that I, I, it was you against Taz uh, from Fully Loaded, I believe 2000 or something. And the reason, the only reason that it, it came back into my mind and I hadn't seen it so long is because it was in the book. Um, self-help, life lessons from uh, the bizarre wrestling career of Al Snow. Get it on Amazon, folks. Check it out. Um, but the move that really, now you say that and it's in my head, the top rope leg drop, you know, and, and for, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, how, how would you describe that maneuver? <laughs> uh, well, you basically, you know, you're up on the top rope, which is at least six, six and a half feet above mm-hmm. the ring platform. And then you, you jump off and you literally stick out both feet and you're landing on just one hip, pretty much the uh, total impact to all the weight. If you're about 200 to, or I mean, 230 or 240. Yeah. Um, all of that impact along with the height and the velocity um, basically go up your spine and into your neck and your head and, you know, and of course down your leg. So it's, uh, you know, um, some guys have, some guys have uh, done it for years and not had any problems. And some of, you know, like Hulk Hogan, because of his size, yeah. You know, he had both hips replaced because all he did was just a jumping leg drop yeah. for, for years, you know, several times a night. So yeah. it uh, it will break you down. Absolutely. I mean, hopefully at some point we would love to have him on the show to talk about so many different things. And, you know, that that's a topic for another time, um, because I think, you know, j- just touching on that, I think this is opening up opportunities, not just for wrestlers, but for, for so many other people to explore um from their own point of view, you know, basically how they're feeling and the, the situations that have led them down certain paths and things, um, which is a really obviously positive sure. thing for, for so many. I wanted to ask you about a specific individual. Now, again, just setting the stage, folks, Al's now in the WWE, traveling all over the world. Marty Gennetti. Um, and yes. the reason I bring up Marty, I got to meet Marty uh, last year in the Full of a Wrestling event in Liverpool. It was literally like meeting a long lost friend. He literally comes up to the, the right side of me, gives me the biggest hug. And it, it was just, it was wonderful. But yeah. in the, the eyes of, of everything that's going on, you can see somebody that has had a lot of struggles throughout his life. Um, and you, you've told obviously many stories about Marty. I want to ask you, what was it like being paired with Marty Gennetti in 1996 and being on the road with him um, during that time? Marty was, uh, he's an awesome individual mm-hmm. and very talented. And I think under utilized, under appreciated, under developed, you know, utilized guy, he just was self-destructive and for, he has a, so many, he has his issues and his demons, but Marty is a genuine person. He's a wonderful human being. Um, and the only person that Marty really victimized is, is himself. Yeah. You know, he, de- he never does anything to anyone else. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, if you knew his whole story and where he originated and where he came from to where he achieved, yeah, um, people would be astounded. I mean, they would be like, you know, he's very inspirational. If you know the whole thing, it's just sad that, you know, um, for a, like much, like a lot of people, you know, they, they have their own motivations and things that drive them to make decisions that bear a cost and a price that ultimately, um, tear him down, Yeah. You know? I mean, like I said, I mean, Marty, you know, we've all made them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and we're all victims of that. Um, and Marty, you know, couldn't have been sweeter. Uh, got to talk to him for a little bit on a, on several occasions um, throughout the event, and it and it was it it, it was lovely. Um, there was some yeah. that, that were less approachable, but Marty, like I say, was was very much so, um, and it was lovely. Um, what was some of the I suppose the experience that you had with him on the road? Because now you've told the story, uh, you know. How, how was it you phrased it that it was like having to watch a child in some ways, you know, fiddling and, and always doing stuff and he's always thinking and, and always, he's always on the go, basically. Yeah, his brain never stopped, you know. He, he's probably a very creative person, mm-hmm. 
you know, but, and then when he's left to his own devices, you know, <laughs> he, you can just see the wheels turning in his head and he's like, okay, what can I do to entertain myself? What can I do to entertain everybody else? You know, and, you know, and always lighten up the mood and make people laugh and, you know, um, and he just, you know, you can just watch him. He'd just be looking around and you'd be like, okay, what's he going to do now? Like, <laughs> you know, and there was no, there was no restraint and there was no, you know, it was just, a, it was not a matter of if it was a matter of when something was going to happen. Like, you know, and it was, it, it's all harmless. Yeah. You know, it, it never was totally destructive. It was just that um, for him, it caused him a lot of grief and a lot of trouble. And, yeah. and sometimes, and again, because he had no restraint, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, sometimes he would take it too far. So what was one of the, the, the worst <laughs> pranks that you ever saw him um, perform? Uh, I, I I've seen tons. I mean, uh, I've heard a story about when one time they all the guys, all the boys were in Denver. Um, this was before I got with the company, and, okay. and Marty was there, and and um, you know the bus driver for the rental car bus was wasting time and kept you know, and they were afraid they were going to miss their flight, and you know uh, the average person would just sit there and get upset, you know, yeah. wouldn't do anything. Not Marty, because when the guy suddenly made up an excuse because he was getting aggravated with the the guys, including Marty, you know, saying "Let's go," he got walked off the bus and went back in the rental car building, and then Marty just went up and got in the seat and drove the rental car bus to the airport <laughs> and stole it, and then they they just all walked off and left the rental car bus and got on the plane. Oh, so he wasn't when I we we went back to Denver. He was he told me that story. He was like, "Hey, I, I don't know how this is going to go. I'm not allowed to come back here." because he had stolen the rental car bus. Wow. You know, that was, that was kind of his way of doing it. like, well, you know, screw it. You know, we need to get to the gate. We we'll, might as well go. So he just took the bus and, uh, um, and then, uh, one other time he would, uh, you know, when they had the Ico pro WWF had the mm -hmm. bodybuilding, Vince had the bodybuilding thing and he gave everybody these supplements and, and Marty had stored these amino tablets for years in his hot garage in Orlando, Florida, and they were kind of rotten. And he would purposely eat them because it gave him terrible gas. Um, he would, flatulence was horrendous. So he would do it on planes just to make himself laugh. <laughs> and then uh, um, one day we were in San Antonio, there's this little small closet where all the producers met, the agents. And uh, he called me over and he said, well, watch this. And he walked in, shut the door, and I just stood there like, well, what am I watching? And then he came out with a big smile on his face and he goes, just stand here. And he walked off. And then all of a sudden, all of them, like 10 or 12 guys come piling out, screaming, God damn it, Marty. And he went in there and he had uh, farted and uh, just drove them all out of that small little room. He went in and acted like he was having a conversation. And meanwhile, you know, farted and um, just walked out with a big smile on his face, didn't say anything, and then watched everybody compiling out like a building was on fire. So. Oh, boy. that That's, I mean, that's creativity on a whole other level. Um, yes, I, I can appreciate that. I, I really yeah. can. 97, obviously, you know, takes uh, you into your singles run as Leaf Cassidy. Um, and, you know, you, you talk about this in your book. And, and I remember seeing, uh, I think, a lot of your matches against uh, two Two called Scorpio um, and Flash Funk, because he was known in WWE. Um, and there was a lot of them at the pay per views, and business is obviously going through a, a transitional phase. What was it like for you at that point, knowing I pitched this character, I'm no longer with Marty, and maybe my career's not necessarily going as I, as I want it to, as I think as it should? What was kind of your mindset around that time? Well, I was in a very bad place. I pointed the finger at everyone else instead of myself. Um, didn't take personal responsibility and uh, for my own uh, missed opportunities and uh, tried to blame other people. Um, then, you know, uh, but once I had made a decision again, yeah, um, that was when things started to change. And, uh, you know, I decided to take control of my fate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that was where the direction changed. And uh, the more I pointed my finger at everybody else, the more things remained the same. The more yeah. I realized that I was the only person that could control me because I couldn't control other people. I could only control me. Then it became a different, a different situation. Mm -hmm. So that, that certain that realization is what, what changed it. 
Yeah. Well, I was going to say the sudden realization of, I think as a, as a, as a literal quote in your book, I've got to get out of here. Um, obviously, you know, well, I knew it. If I stayed there and remained there, the perception yeah. and the uh, view would not change. I had yeah. to go someplace else and recreate myself to where they saw me in a different light. And, um, you know, perception is reality. Yeah. You know, without a question or a doubt, I can't change reality per se. But if I can make you think that grass is uh, the color green is actually the color blue, yep. then I've changed your perception. So therefore I've changed your reality. That's it. That's so. it. Absolutely. And, you know, it comes back to that whole thing of not holding on to something so tightly that if you need to let go of it for whatever reason that, you know, you, your life crumbles, basically. You ever go through Correct. ECW? Then, so go. Uh, people have a tendency to, you know, do that. And, yeah. and I tell people all the time, I, you know, look, you, if you're miserable, you're truly miserable, then make a change. Yeah. You know, you're not a tree, you know, you're not planted there. Yeah. You can, you can, I mean, the minute you, you know, but people uh, for a false sense of security um, will remain in even a situation that makes them miserable because they feel secure. Yeah. And uh, because they're either the devil they know than the devil they don't. Correct. So. Correct. And, and sometimes, like you say, the, the opportunity to do something else can seem really, really scary. And obviously you talk about relationships and so many other things that people stay unhappy because like you say, what they know is better than, Ooh, what about if, if, if you yeah. can go and achieve your dreams, if you could meet the man or woman of your dreams, um, you know, people always think, but, but what if I don't, you know, and, and that's, and, that, and that's, you're playing the what if game wrong. Correct. Because we all play the what if game and everybody plays the what if game because yep. it's a it's a human bred yep. in us from, as a survival instinct, so we always lean to the negative. But if you're going to play the what if game, you also have to go, well, you know, what if I leave the house and I get hit, hit, hit by a car? Well, yep. what if you leave the house and you encounter a Hollywood agent who decides that you're exactly what they're looking for and you now will come have a career in movies and you become a movie star? Correct. Um, and those things do happen. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. you know, they're, they're, the odds are high, but you can't, it can't occur, but it, it never occurs if you never leave the house, Correct. you know, all those possibilities are shut off all those avenues, all those doors. Yeah. So I mean, John, I apologize. Yep. I sincerely do. I've got to, if we could pick back up yep. um, another day, I've got to produce a television show that I'm, and I'm, I'm about to, um, I've got people waiting and that's I'm okay. That's not a problem. So sorry. I no, kept you, you waiting and you let me know when you're <sighs> free and we can pick up with part two with Al Snow. Yes, I would love to. I would absolutely love to continue our conversation. I that's just really trying to juggle too many things at one time. <laughs> so. I hear it and I understand. Don't worry, my friend. I will catch you soon. Okay. We'll, we will reschedule. We'll do. Take care.